Hi, and welcome to Whitman Partners 40 Fast and Future series. Today's guest is Jennifer Kuhar. 40 Fast and Future is where we celebrate the Director of Surgical Services on the Ascension Pathway. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jennifer, would you mind uh, starting by telling us a little bit about what brought you to this, uh, this stage in your career? Yes, um, you know, probably like most, uh, uh, traveling uh, for your p profession is uh, something that, you know, is always in the back of your mind and and uh, and you start your profession and you um, hone in on it and, and do the best that you can and, and years go by. Um, and so my husband and I decided that once he retired, we we would travel together and and uh, uh, and I would be able to to um, um, assist other uh, organizations and uh, and be able to see the world a little bit. Um, and probably like most, the pandemic um, created a, a work from home opportunity for my husband, and um, and it was really a good time for us to to begin traveling. Well, let's start by exploring the topic of mentoring. Okay. Did you have a mentor and how did they help you? You know, I have to say that I didn't have a formal mentoring program. Um, you know, coming up uh, through through the years, most of it's through experience. <laughs> I, um, I did have the opportunity to have such great uh, leaders that invested in me and, 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 and you know, provided me those that guidance. Um, peers, um, when early on, my peers said, you know, absolutely, um, you know, get certified, get into the profession, understand the guidelines. Um, uh, and so I did pretty early on. And so uh, uh, no, no formal mentoring, but uh, but a lot of a lot of assistance on my journey. Do you mentor someone? Uh, I have in the past, um, actually, my my last travel assignment. Um, we had some uh, novice uh, managers and just to come in and kind of guide and, and make sure that we uh, level set the, the OR for them and, and put them on the right path. Um, and I enjoyed it very much. It was, it's, uh, it's, it's great to, to see them grow and develop. Sure. In your experience, how much communication is ideal between you and your boss in order to optimize or be efficient in terms of day-to-day -day activities? You know, I would say that, you know, those those formal one-to-one -one meetings um, really, you know, possibly two weeks, maybe even a month. Um, but really the best thing for me is just, um, you know, quick access, a text or a quick email just to clarify. Um, uh, I work best under um, um, give me the goal and I will achieve the goal. Sure. Okay. And do you often find yourself thrown into antiquated systems or policies? Can you give an example of a something that should be part of a bygone era? Yeah, I think probably um, the one that you see the most that you that you wish that um, uh, could be improved on is just that that electronic tracking board. Um, it's just, uh, it's so difficult to manage uh, the operating rooms with um, with handwritten OR boards and you have to run to pre-op and run to PACU and, and make sure that you have uh, everything, you know, on uh, on course with the electronic tracking board. It just certainly makes life so much easier. Um, I would say that just about every C-suite needs to, needs to invest in that. Okay, great. Terrific answer. Tell me more about it. So um, I presume now as a traveler, you've seen a few different of these electronic tracking boards. Mm -hmm. Is there one software or one board that you have seen that you find superior to others? You know, just having the electronic tracking board in itself is a game changer for some of these organizations that, that haven't had it in the past. But, you know, on a personal note, um, Epic really does seem to be uh, my my choice in a in a tracking board. Sure. Okay. All right. And so, Epic's a big choice. So <laughs> if, uh, if you walk into a small hospital critical access, for example, and they are still handwritten, and you wanted to help them go move, migrate towards electronic, could you? Is there anything that you could do to help 
advance that from handwritten? Um, you know, definitely the buy-in from C-Suite just to get it started. Okay. But um, I did begin um, one EPIC journey, and I was a certified uh, EPIC um, trainer and, uh, and developer uh, for that organization um, when that came about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I did enjoy that very much, just developing the perioperative aspect of EPIC. Okay, great. While there's no specific path to becoming a director, what steps or training do you recommend? What would be, for example, the um, additional training that you felt was the difference between stepping from a manager role up to a director role? Um, you know, for me, as a bachelor prepared leader, um, getting my certification in surgical services management um, really, uh, really helped to develop that that mini MSN that they that they um, that they provide you. It, it really um, made a world of difference. Interesting. You're referring to the CSSM certification, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. OK, good. Tell me a little bit about that. So if, if there is a director that found that to be the piece of nugget of insight that they really want to take from this. How long does it take to prepare for the CSSM exam? Tell me a little bit more about that, your experience there. Well, the CSSM exam, when I um, took it, there was a, um, a forum that was offered prior to one of the AORN conferences. And so uh, I was invested in my current employer, invested in me. Um, and so I went to the summit. Uh, it was two days of a kind of a crash course, um, but extremely, extremely um, uh, helpful and, and insightful. Um, and, and I came home and, and took the test. Great. And did you pass it on the first try? I did. I did. Yeah. Well, anyway, congratulations. I know that the pass fail rate is not easy. So good job. That's true. That's true. I did have to say that um, when I took the test, uh, I was uh, among the first in the South uh, East uh, region to, to pass and be certified. Well, that's great. That's great. OK, let's uh, let's turn our attention to your again relationship with the C-suite. What investment would you like the C-suite to make to make your operating room more profitable or to help with an efficiency? You know, I think just like just like other organizations and, and other um, industries, we really need to um, develop that one stop shop um, mentality. Um, I think healthcare is, has really lagged in in that ability to um, you know, patients come in and they register and they see their surgeon and they get they get labs done and they're able to, you know, get their next appointment um, kind of all in the same day, all in the same area. Um, I really, really think that and some do such an excellent job of that. Um, and so I think the biggest that would be the biggest um, piece of advice that I would have just try to make sure that we you know, we're always trying to streamline the surgical services experience, um, and some really have mastered that quite well. Um, so just to just to really invest in that. I'm interested. Tell me more. So you say some have mastered that quite well. What's the difference between one that mass has mastered it quite well and one that is not quite there yet? Where what's the difference? Where are they losing the patient or where is the patient stepping out of the operating room? You know, I think that the the biggest lag in that is just the um, the the physician's office to uh, the hospital that that relationship. Um, um, really, we've we've done well as as an organization to um, to get them into the operating room to take care of them. Um, you know, their their length of stay and and afterwards, but really just getting them onboarded from the physician's office, I think, um, is something that definitely we can we can improve upon perfect okay do you have a item on your christmas or holiday wish list for 2022 for your operating room um i think i think the biggest thing again is uh investing in the team obviously at this in this stage um uh, of, of the industry we really need to invest in, in what we do have uh, i think the other thing to invest in is is um you know the communication to the team um Making sure that we we stay current with um, um, their scheduling abilities, 
you know, we do talk about antiquated um, staffing schedules and call schedules. Um, so I'm really bringing that into the into the current um, industry and uh, allow them to, you know, um, do it from their phones and and uh, and get their email um, instantaneously. I think uh, really would be one thing that that I would like to see. OK, well. I'm I'm interested. You, you brought it back to more antiquated systems and you're saying that a call schedule now via text or via email would be superior. Explore that. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, well, I've used systems um, that that are electronic, that are web based. Um, and and that you just really need to dig into um, uh, working with the with the IT department to to really determine the, the needs of the department and the hours. Um, but you are able to to develop these these schedules and um, uh, and just put it out. Uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the the name of the program that we used. Um, Square, I believe. Um, really, really has an, an excellent program. Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely recommend making sure that um, that we that we step into the into the current um, needs for the team. Certainly. And you're talking about investment in the staff that you have makes me think that you're kind of referring to the burnout issue, the great resignation that we're hearing about in the media and the understaffed, which is so common right now in operating rooms. Right. And by, yeah, right. So the great resignation, um, unfortunately, has affect surgical services as well. Um, uh, I think that uh, it, it, it is discerning for the, um, for the staff to, to feel that, you know, the investment goes into traveling and and not into the into the the current staff. Um, so really, just making sure that you um, you know provide those incentives. Um, you know, when COVID first came around, um, there were uh, bonuses. Um, some organizations gave what was called a hero's bonus. Um, some also just went ahead and, and increased um, salaries. Um, just right off the bat and i think just making sure that they understand that that there are a lot of options out there right now so if you want to keep your great talent you, you really need to invest in them great great what advice do you have for jennifer kuhar moving up when you were a brand new or nurse what advice do you have for your younger self uh, i think you know probably the one thing that that i would tell myself um, then was just to just to trust your path and and um, uh, and make sure that you understand that that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, you know, just just going through uh, and learning and finding that experience and growing um, from other leaders um, really really would uh, probably would have made things a little more streamlined. Okay, great. And then uh, what is Jennifer Kuhar's superpower? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a superpower, um, but I definitely enjoy um, level setting for Joint Commission. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a policy kind of girl, uh, making sure that, that the team is, is uh, educated on um, rationales for guidelines and and that they are a part of that and, and really bringing the team up to the expectations uh, of our of our organization um, is something that I really enjoy. Sounds like teaching the AOR and guidelines in advance of survey is yes. something you really enjoy? Yes. That's great. That's terrific. Well, thanks to Jennifer Kuhar for your um, receiving of the 40 Fast and Future Award. And thanks for your insights today. Um, have a wonderful uh, day and keep up the great work. Thank you so much. All right, take care.